Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture ebook. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar, and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian tsunami. Tonight, we will finish the chapter on early warning and forecasting in the third part of chapter 19. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading sessions before we start reading tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture-sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal health care access, Sustainable Development Goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight we will start with uh, the third and final part of the chapter on early warning and forecasting calamities, chapter 19. The WHO report called Tsunami 2004, a comprehensive analysis, the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below, has documented that, quote, unlike other disastrous events that occur with little or no notice or advance warning such as earthquakes, tsunamis occur rarely. While strong earthquakes of magnitude 7 or greater occur about 18 times each year and great earthquakes of magnitude 8 or higher occur about once every year, a widely destructive tsunami occurs only one, about once every 15 years. Consequently, researchers rarely observe more than the aftermath of a tsunami. Possibly the only disaster caused by a natural hazard that is more rare than a major tsunami is a major asteroid impact. An asteroid impact equivalent to the impact of a hydrogen bomb occurs only about once every 200 to 300 years, unquote. The Institute of Seismological Research or ISR, the link of which is again going to be put up here, of the government of Gujarat in Gandhinagar, Gujarat, is developing an early warning system by way of reading seismographs to alert people and the governments up to a distance of 350 kilometers in and around the epicenter, if it is, say, in the Kutch region, to alert the administration about an imminent earthquake within a gap of 30 to 40 seconds. This can help a great deal in saving lives in multi-story buildings in urban areas like Ahmedabad and Baroda within seconds of the earthquake. For this, we already have seismographs and 25 axillographs are also installed. Further, we are in the process of installing another 50 more. We also have to test these and are installing softwares for this before we can announce a model of early warning for earthquakes in Gujarat, said Dr. B.K. Rastogi, Director General of the Institute of Seismological Research, in an exclusive telephonic discussion with me on the 20th of July 2014. Uh, here's another link from the USGS. It's the online link for a historical database of earthquakes maintained by the United States Geological Survey. Although the USGS says it is not being updated from April 2012, its historical value cannot change. However, I searched for the details of the 1861 earthquake off the west coast of Sumatra and could not find it on the link. Many questions are beyond the realm of scientific explanation as of today. Scientific community dismisses as conjecture anecdotal evidence like wildlife behavior before earthquake strike, cetacean strandings, etc. Why is it that earthquakes that occur in the anti-meridian hours, especially the ones early in the morning, are deadly in terms of impact and the ones which uh, are after midday are not so brutal in impact? I have heard anecdotes from survivors of the Asian tsunami alluding to strange animal behavior in the minutes before the tsunami. Reports from Cousin Island show that turtles stayed off the beaches from the 26th to 27th of December 2004, says the UNEP study called Tsunami Report on page 103 and 104. Birds were seriously confabulating on the ground instead of on the trees about half an hour before the tsunami, said survivors in Karaikal, Pondicherry or Puducherry. Uh, that is in India, on the east coast of India. 
Cattle started running inland in the few minutes before the tsunami in Velangani, said Rupa Prabhu Dotson in Bangalore in a discussion to me with me. Birds were not chirping in Nicobar on the early morning of the mega earthquake. A pet cat in the home of Miss Suchitra Rao in Chennai became extremely restive on the 11th of April 2012, minutes before the strike slip earthquake occurred off the west coast of Sumatra. Minutes before the sea inundated us, the cat ran up a tree behind my restaurant, said Miss Chamli de Soiza, a restaurant here in Alutgama in Sri Lanka, while talking to me in an exclusive discussion. As Sunil Shanta Sudhusinghe, an employee at the rest house in Tangala in Sri Lanka, he quote, I quote him, yes, the animal behavior needs to be studied. I do not recall anything about watching them in particular, but after the tsunami, when I went for a walk in the evening, I was surprised, surprised to see not one body of a dog, cat or cow, only of human beings, unquote. Saran Kulkarni, an Indian oceanographer, is among the skeptics. He says, I don't buy the theory that whale strandings are indicative of in impending natural calamities because how many whale strandings have occurred without an earthquake following, Kulkarni told me for an I IPS article. Undersea earthquake and geomagnetic errors in navigations. G. Macro Rhynchus is one of such animals which use the magnetic field to navigate. Alteration in the magnetic field may misguide them resulting in their death. A recent study by the US Geological Survey reveals that an undersea earthquake with a magnitude of 4.7 on the Richter scale struck the Andaman Sea region on the 21st of October 2012 uh, at latitude 13.783 degrees north and 96.225 degrees east at a depth of 50, 30 kilometers. The epicenter of the earthquake was 359 kilometers away from the Elizabeth Bay of North Andaman, 295 kilometers or 183 miles west northwest, that is 301 degrees from Mergui, 334 kilometers or 207 miles at 179 degrees south from Yangon and 336 kilometers uh, south southwest from Molomine or called Maulmin, Myanmar. Earthquakes release a lot of energy. An earthquake of magnitude a little above M5 is capable of producing low frequency sounds that are very intense, 240 to 239 uh, decibels uh, or 1 pi PA at 1 meter, if I read it right. However, this is within a large whale hearing range of 16 to 44 hertz. It is postulated that the magnetic waves generated by the undersea earthquake might have altered the navigational path of whales and propelled them towards the shallow waters of the Elizabeth Bay, unquote. Sonic waves. On some occasions, whales have stranded shortly after a military sonar activity in the area. The low frequency active sonar caused by, used by the military to detect submarines is the loudest sound ever put into the sea and can retain its power across hundreds of miles. At amplitude of 240 decibels, it is loud enough to kill whales and dolphins and is already causing mass strandings and deaths in the Bahamas, an area where the United States is conducting exercises. As the Andaman Nicobar Islands are hinterland to quite a few countries, the sonic wave emanated from warships might have caused the stranding, says the study, mass stranding of pilot whale, Globicephalia, Globicephala, Macro, Rinkus Gray, published in Current Science, Volume 104, Number 1, 10th January 2013. Many questions remain unanswered. If a large number of earthquakes of high magnitude and impact occur on the 11th and the 26th of different months, surely it has something, something to do with the tidal tractions of the oceans, subtracting synchronously with the lunar cycle? It does not mean that every 26th of the month is a, there is a big earthquake. There are no earthquakes on many 26th. Could it be that when the tidal traction subtraction slips before the 26th of a month, then there is an earthquake on the 26th of that month? Uh, as a responsible writer, I wish to clarify to the scientific community that I have no intention of speculating, but just noting down a thought which possibly merits a bit of further research. For Three weeks before the Asian tsunami, Bangalore tsunami survivor Ms. Radha Raj 
had been foretold by an astrologer that she is likely to face a watery grave in a life-threatening situation within the next month. What scientific alibi can possibly explain this to our understanding? What explains the 60-year cycles for calamities forecast in many oriental lunar almanacs? If climate change and El Nino southern oscillation cycles are cyclical, certainly release of seismic and volcanic energy should also be logically cyclical. Questions stare at the scientific community too. Is there a cycle to volcanic eruptions and earthquakes? Does the movement of convective currents in the southern hemisphere follow an anti-clockwise motion too? The Asian tsunami was preceded by tsunamis on four prior occasions with gaps of 60 years spacing them in recorded history. Dr. George P. Karayanis is going to be quoted now. The problem with forecasting hydrometeorological hazards and mitigating their impact is not only the lack of proper instrumentation, said Dr. George P. Karayanis. Warning or forecasting requires much more than just instruments. The same thing can be said of hydrogeological hazards too. Orissa Administrative Service Officer Sambit Raut said in an exclusive discussion with me for an article by me on the impact of hydrometeorological disasters on agriculture in Interpress News Service, the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below, that he still remembers what a fisherman near Chilka Lake told him on the night that the cyclone Philin made landfall. I'm going to quote Sambit Raut as quoting the fisherman. There is no more cause for worry, sir, because the wind has changed direction, Routh told IPS, quoting the fisherman. I was floored by his native wisdom, madam. Madam, He also alludes to an almanac anointed day that when tribes in North India stock food, grains and fuel would ostensibly for imminent calamities. It would be specious to conclude that scientific forecast or foresight is missing. Could it be that the scientific community has still not comprehended non-cognitive algorithms of natural phenomena? That's all for tonight. In uh, tonight's, and we, with that, we finish chapter 19 uh, early warning and forecasting calamities. Next week, I will start with chapter 20 role of bio shields in disaster mitigation. Trust me, it's very interesting. I hope to catch you during the live interaction on the 26th of February uh, after the video at 7 30 pm Indian time. Until next week's video, take care, keep smiling, stay safe, and stay home. Ciao.